To start things off, Ben, Afshin, uh, Brandon, would you agree that in the current age and time of sort of the digital age, innovation is not necessarily about technology um, as it was perhaps, let's say, in early 20th century with Henry Ford's automation scale thing happened? Do you think it's, it's still the same or how do you think it's different today? Yeah, good question. I'll, I'll, I'll kick us off here a little bit. Yeah. Um, I would say it's definitely different than it used to be because there's just so many other factors that play into that. Kind of how I like to think about innovation is the implementation and adoption of a new product process, right? So it's not necessarily technology focused. You might you might leverage technology to facilitate one of those, but the key part being it is the adoption of something. Mm -hmm. you, you can build something with technology, but if nobody uses it, it's really not innovation. Of course. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that uh, in my mind, innovation is romanticized in, in most senses you know when you think of innovation you think of an ipad you think of you know a, a model t ford you know taking over something like that but in my mind innovation is just simply progress you know progress for technology could be progress for society culture uh, business strategy you, you can innovate anything um and, and most of the things we think of and, and i'm you know uh, flaw to it like anybody. When I think of innovation, the first thing that comes to my mind is something cool and new and fancy. But in general, I think most in innovation is the small things, you know, the little changes, the incremental progress, whether it be technology that's more easily visible or whether it be something behind the scenes, efficiency driven. Um, I think that's where most of the innovation occurs. But at the same time, there's another end of the spectrum, which is more disruptive. So I think innovation is, um, in a sense, you know, every day. It's always here. It's omnipresent, uh, but it's easier to latch on to those big picture type items. Yeah, I think where I would add to that, you know, I like the way that Brandon put the definition. Uh, the one thing I think is a little bit different, though, today, when we when, when we think about innovation contextually versus just sort of technology wise, is that innovation requires a lot of speed. I think it's faster today. The competitive mm -hmm. landscape is a lot broader today. And I think innovation requires an ecosystem. And I think that's where it's a little bit different, right? Rather than tech, thinking about technology per se or a process, it actually requires an ecosystem to be successful in an organization. And so really, I think about innovation more as, a, as an organizational capability mm -hmm. than necessarily a particular outcome, like a new thing or a new process, but really about the ecosystem and the manner in which we're able to get that adoption and take those novel ideas and actually bring value from them um, to the organization. Afshin, how would you define innovation? If let me, if I was to ask you, what is what is that formal definition of yeah. innovation? I think I have a pretty simplistic definition yeah. of innovation. Um, I, you know, I think it's really about um, the discovery and implementation of novel ideas and solutions okay. that can add value. And so that can really be anywhere. If we put it in a business context, it could be anywhere in the organization where you can really introduce innovation. Um, that's the way I look at the formal definition. Yeah. But I think really coming back to you know the prior point is is how do you make innovation real? And you had mentioned before you know you think about the the macro environment changing really quickly. I think even strategically looking at innovation, it's almost really about positioning. Yeah. Right. It's a capability that allows you to position strategically to be able to take advantage of business opportunities. Right. It's a capability that allows you to quickly adapt to the external environment to be able to introduce whether it's a new technology that helps you enhance your business. Maybe it's an evolution in the business model itself. It could be a lot of different things across the organization. So yes, it's those introduction of new ideas, but in many ways it's also, you know, it could be a strategic pillar for a business when I think about positioning in the market or capabilities of the organization to adapt to, to macro changes. I like that, it's a great one. Ben? Yeah, I'd, I'd simplify it in my mind is just innovation is progress. Yep. And I think about it as, uh, to use Ashin's words, you know, uh, taking novel approaches to either a problem or an opportunity. It could be either one. You know, a lot of times people think of innovation as solving something. Sometimes it's creating something, but sometimes it's solving something just the same. So yeah, in my mind, it's really just progress in, in the broad spectrum of things with, with new approaches. I'm going to agree with both of these guys. They're spot on with the definition. I'm just going to add it has to be the implementation and adoption. And yeah. the reason I emphasize that is we've innovated a lot with technology and business and we've implemented it. Right. But if it's not adopted and not used, did you did you really innovate? Anything? Mm -hmm. right. yeah. so. did, did it really last? Did it really get <laughs> changed? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think the thing that resonates with me as I was listening uh, to the three comments was, you know, it's it's the adoption, it's all that, but it's also creating value. Right. I think at the end of the day, if it's innovation just for the sake of innovation, never really lasts. If it's not creating value and if it's uh, value for the organization and for the stakeholders, that's what the end goal in many ways is. Right. Well, and I think I think to Brandon's point, right, it's 
the value comes from the adoption. Of course, absolutely. Right? So if, if, if we were to put it in technical terms, we would call it maybe scale and sustainability. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the innovation has to go out to the organization and be used to actually start generating the value and sustaining that. So, I mean, I think that's really critical when we think about value creation, the mechanism is the adoption. Well, as you think about innovation, and we haven't got into this yet, but there's open and closed innovation, right? And you only know what you know and you don't know what you don't know, right? So you've got to bring partners in to help help you understand what's taking place outside of the walls that you work within. What are, what are other industries doing? What are other businesses doing? What are other opinions on what you have developed inside? And so those partnerships are important. Uh, really to stimulate some some thoughts, get people to think a little bit differently. And there's always the, I call it the consultant effect. You know, if you get an outside party that comes in and kind of validates your idea that carries some weight across the organization. So that's helpful as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo Brandon on that. I think it really comes down to perspectives. You know, it's so hard to disrupt yourself. And it's so hard to acknowledge that it's hard to disrupt yourself. You, you just frequently need somebody else that's thinking differently, doing differently. And that's usually what happens when you start partnering with somebody. You know, your core business is what it is. You live it every single day. I mean, literally, you know, you're, you're there 40, 50, 60 hours a week doing the same thing. And you're darn good at it. But when it comes time to deviate a little bit off that, um, it's tough to, to be OK feeling uncomfortable. So you sometimes need somebody to come in and give you a new idea or push you in a direction and say, hey, this is what could be and to challenge kind of the status quo. So I think that's why it's critical to have those new perspectives come along. Not only do I agree and where I would add is I think that can also be an accelerator. So part of it is, is you get the new ideas, you get you new perspectives that'll make you perhaps think differently about um, how you're going about innovating in your organization. But there are there are different kinds of partners you can have, right? You can have large partners that can come in that have a lot of capabilities or perhaps smaller partners that are very specific in what they do. Um, and really thinking about those partners as, as ways to augment um, your own strategy and to accelerate certain parts of it to be more competitive, I think is really a, an effective way of, of using them and why they're important, you know, as, as part of as part of your approach. You know, I'll add to that, you know, if you think about innovation, it's really part of innovation is changing the behavior of a, of a human, right? And we're in the oil, we are in the energy business. We're, we're not experts at changing people's behavior. So if we can get outside help to come in and help us do that more effectively and efficiently, but help drive innovation. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say too, to Ashin's point, like um, in my mind, a lot of that partnership is around like new perspectives, but it could also be an accelerator in the sense that you have a vision, you know where you want to go, you know where you want to bend into and off course from where, where you are now, but you need help getting there. And you could either go it alone, put lots of resources building that expertise, or you could leverage some existing expertise that's out there today and really accelerate those, those learnings and then ultimately the value. If you can get to the implementation point, you can really accelerate the value for shareholders. There's, there's a lot of complexity in technology. There's a lot of complexity in doing business. Um, it can be challenging to, to really understand all of the various complexities and how they need to relate together. And I think that's where partners can also come in and help. Mm -hmm. And not only as an accelerator, but where can, where can they apply their expertise that might be in a very specific niche that could be very valuable to your business, that if you were to try to develop that capability internally, of course it's possible, but it could be very costly to do so, not only to build, but also to sustain organizationally. And that's really where you can use, I think, partners to come in, accelerate, ideate, change perspectives, but also help drive clarity into some of the complexities that exist both technologically and from executing that technology, most importantly in the business context, uh, and actually deliver that adoption and value that Brandon was speaking to earlier. So, so adding on to that, I mean, you know, what I hear is that to compete in like this hyper competitive, unstable sort of uh, environment, you know, organizations need to have dynamic capabilities, whether it's agility, whether it's flexibility, resilience or speed, there's a need for that. Um, I'm curious to sort of get like as leaders in this space, what are some examples where you see that, you know, a specific need, whether it's close to your operations that uh, you're, you know, um, needing to accelerate, uh, you bring in third, like external partners, either in the form of startup sort of capability or some other partners. But what are some examples that you've seen where you um, value uh, some of this perspective, right? Um, so I'm curious to, you know, get an example from, you know, you guys as big industry leaders, what are some examples of um, applications of either technology or capability or some perspective that you think that has helped with these partnerships? One that, that really jumps out at me right off the top of my head is, is cloud technology partners. Yeah. 
Um, the various cloud providers, the hyperscalers, they provide a lot of different technology solutions. Um, they're always evolving. The mm -hmm. way that you can get cloud technologies to work together are changing as businesses are really, really getting involved in finding new novel ways to to apply technologies, those particular cloud technologies to their business. And so when I think about having a cloud technology partner who is really on top of the change mm -hmm. with what's happening in cloud and what that can mean to your business, it can really help drive agility into using those technologies uh, a lot more efficiently because they are they are costly or they can be costly. Mm -hmm. And so using them not only effectively, but um, you know, cost, not a business effectively, but also cost effectively is really critical. And having those partners to help you walk through that, I think it's really important to driving success in the right ROI from your investments with cloud. Yeah, I'd, I'd kind of go down a similar path um, on the technology front. And, and the way I kind of see it in some examples just most recently in my world is, um, you know, we, we have certain technologies that we are really good at using and utilizing to, to improve business decisions. But then conversely, there are certain aspects of technology that we're not good at. We don't create the technology. We don't drive the ins and outs of what the technology is. But the people that are doing that, say startups, et cetera, uh, they're very good at creating, but they have no ability to implement in terms of drive business decisions. So it has to be some form of a partnership to say, hey, we have a cool tool. We have a new way of looking at it. And we say, well, we know how to use it if you can kind of bring that to the table. But those, uh, those startups, they always need the refinement of how you actually utilize it. So their vision of how it's utilized rarely is how it's actually utilized. It, it takes it takes a it takes a real partnership and some tough times coming together and figuring out like here's how you should use it and like no this is how we're gonna use it. And, and you know there's that back and forth that really gets you to progress and it's not comfortable and it's always messy but but that's just what it takes when you're when you're doing something new. You know the interesting thing is as Afshin was talking about sort of the cloud aspect of that right. I mean that is something that is new to the I would say the energy industry in some ways right. I think. They've always been technology adopters, but like cloud is something new that is just changing the way business is being done. Do you see other avenues, uh, Ben, at least from your perspective, whether let's say it's reservoir characterization or operations or anything that where you see in need of these partnerships now more than perhaps in ever before? Yeah, absolutely. To me, it's got to be in, in the field. Yeah. It's an automation. Um, you can just conceptualize the, the automation technology that is out yet out there for other industries, whether it be manufacturing, you know, the development and emerging field of robotics, etc. Uh, you have to, to imagine that at some point we find a way to really work together and, and change the paradigm entirely. Mm -hmm. You know, like the efficiency that we could drive into energy um, sustainability, you know, and energy um, resilience. I think it, I think it could be tremendous. Um, but we're not close to that right now. You know, that's in the future out there. But then again, some of those things happen quickly. You yeah. know, once you start heading down that path and you start trying some things, you're really surprised how well it works and the applicability and, and then you're off and running. And so it's that access to that partnership through the technology or information or capability that allows you to accelerate some of the learnings and efficiency that you have. Absolutely. Got. You know, like uh, I'd say like our industry is really efficient as it sits today. Yeah. But that's within as we know it today, mm -hmm. you know, like the capability of, of altering that status quo is sometimes uncomfortable. But man, you could you can see that vision of where we could go as not just an industry, but as a country when it comes to energy security and resilience um, through automation of, of our fields and stuff like that. So I think there's a ton of opportunity in the future in that space. So, awesome. Brandon, you've uh, been on this transformation journey, um, I would say, what, what are some of the the reasons you think partnerships are more critical than perhaps in the past. Yeah, I'll pivot a little bit off what Afshin shared. Um, you know, as you as you think about cloud technologies, they've also innovated over the past several years and they've also advanced rapidly mm -hmm. and they've added new features and functions. And it's difficult for staff on, on the technical teams to keep up with those changes. And if you're really? not on top of those type of changes, you're going to end up with a cloud bill that you weren't expecting. Right. So being able to leverage a partner that understands those features and functions and what they've added and allow you to implement those correctly and maintain your spend around those while still taking advantage of the new features has been critical for us as it relates to cloud partners for sure. You know, the, one of the things so you're talking more about from a technology and your ability of your uh, staff in house to keep up with change. What about just talent overall, right? I mean, I think, you know, the one thing that we see, um, you know, working with many of our sort of uh, clients and uh, customers is there's, you know, digital talent right? That is very different versus perhaps the energy industry talent that was used to be in the past, like the petrotechnical teams were very different. And there's a difference in talent requirements. So do you see that that has also been a need for the partnerships because the access to talent is 
very different than perhaps what it was in the past. And then those that wanted to work or don't want to do that anymore. Yeah, I think it's kind of twofold. One, there's a gap in talent. Mm -hmm. So finding that talent and partners, and partners oftentimes can deliver on that talent. And that talent often brings experience from other industries, which is valuable. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Well, also, we have a gap with the talent that we have, and I call it kind of a, a digital literacy gap. Mm -hmm. We need to close that as we move forward. So bringing partners in to help do that, I think is important. There's a lot, too, with the technology space that as it's grown, like take data as just one example. Um, the depth of specialization in data is growing as data grows. So when we think about skills and talents as innovation occurs, as we see more of these technologies being adopted by industries in general, not any specific industry, but just industry wide and the competition um, for, for talent, you know, growing with the growth of these technologies, the specialization also increases too. And I think that also creates some challenges where you use partners who have specialized in yeah. those areas, whether it's a particular sensor technology or whether it's certain cloud aspects, or maybe it's data, um, et cetera, AI, ML, you know, there's a lot of different specializations that are really growing that are becoming critical. When you think about, again, going back to adoption and sustainability, realizing the value means you have to adopt it and sustain it. And there are complexities that come from introducing these technologies where more specialization is necessary to actually achieve sustainability. Yeah. Can I ask you a question off of that? Sure. Now you mentioned that the depth of data experience is, 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 is increasing, right? Do you, do you think that's for now mostly in the tech space or do you see that adoption um, taking place outside of the, the technical department as well? well? I don't quite understand the question. What do you mean? Well, it seems to me like most of the data experience resides in a technical department like IT or a data department, right? But in order for us to scale as an industry, those, that knowledge and expertise needs to also go out into the business, right? Yeah, they need definitely. to understand data Absolutely. better as well. Do you see that starting to happen? I do. I think I think when we think about getting the ROI on data, data literacy, so just sort of a subset of digital literacy is, is really critical. Um, and I hear a lot more um, business leaders talking about data literacy. How do we get more ROI off of our data investments? And that really comes to, in my view, that comes to how do you best equip, equip the individuals who are closest to the business problems to solve those business problems um, with the data assets that a company has. And, and really, in my view, that's how do you how do you get the most value out of those data assets? And that comes back to equipping those individuals who are closest to the business problems to help use that data to solve business problems I agree and, and get speed and agility. Yeah. So, and I think that's critical because when we think about, you know, I think data has a really interesting property. Um, I think it's one of the only assets that a company has that appreciates the more you use it. Mm -hmm. So when you think about equipping your, your team members to be able to use that data, you're not only getting the value from that transactional element of solving that business problem, but you're also adding value to the data asset itself because at, you're going to get more speed, velocity, and data gravity towards that data as more business problems are solved. You'll just realize more value from the underlying asset. And I think that's a really powerful mechanism um, for organizations when they think about the data assets and what they can deliver to the organizations. I agree completely. And I think, Brandon, to your point, right, uh, on sort of the the, tab, the domain expertise sort of expanding, not only just within the IT or the data departments into other functions as well. I know that um, working with a lot of the um, you know, petrotechnical folks, whether it's reservoir engineers or production engineers or supervisors, their ability to make decisions based on the latest analytics platform that's coming out there is only limited until their own ability to digest that information and ask the right question. Ben, you, do you see sort of that same um, digital literacy, I like that term, Brandon, uh, sort of uh, gap in uh, on your side and your teams as well? Yeah, so, so in my role, I lead a, a subsurface problem solving team, yeah. essentially. So petroleum engineers, petroleum geoscientists. And uh, over the past couple of years, I've really been shocked. You walk up and down the hall and you see most of the engineers and geoscientists with a Python book or an R book on their desk. Mm -hmm. You know, they're taking courses at night. Some of them are going back to pick up their masters in data science, et cetera. Um, so the, the evolution is just naturally occurring because what we've done is we've been able to get very good at capturing data and now it makes it easy for people to utilize it. So what most of those individuals don't want to do is put in the effort to capture. They want somebody else to help with that. But now that we've gotten that far along, man, they're, they're excited around what they can do with that data. 
and that's that's um it's a journey you know it doesn't happen overnight yeah. but i've been really pleased with uh, the progression of data literacy on the technical side so far at least in my world on the day to day i think we've really been making some progress in the past couple of years yeah, and yeah that's good to hear that for sure i mean i feel like if, you, if you're a petroleum engineer of any kind and you're not doing something to become more astute with machine learning and ai you're you're, you're behind yeah, without a doubt. And, you know, on top of that, just on like there's the, the data analysis side, the data science side, but just um, the ability to play with data, you know, in, in a programming sense, mm -hmm. in a coding sense, in a, in a way to be more efficient, you know, that is just tremendous. And um, I have just been really impressed with people's uh, desire to get after it because they see the future like, hey, this is this is where my career is going. I got to get pretty good at this. I do think it's important to say, like, that doesn't mean out with the old skills. Yes it means you got to make room for the new too. Absolutely. So the core skills around, you know, reservoir characterization, geoscience, you know, mapping, that kind of stuff. Um, those are still there. Uh, people just are realizing you got to combine that with more data literacy and a, just a different emerging skill set overall. The other thing is, um, I think uh, from a corporate perspective, I think the interesting dynamic with especially the VC world sort of stepping up and <clears throat> startups getting access to funding through other channels is uh, it provides an alternative method to a traditional path of corporations to access, um, you know, uh, startups and stuff from um, looking at it from in, in corporate venture side, hedging their bets, de-risking uh, M&A and picking winners. I think that's the, the, the ability that this provides by going down this path of partnerships. Um, also, it gives them access into uh, the cutting edge sort of uh, capabilities that they might not naturally be um, having in-house as well. So that's one aspect that I think uh, that I'm looking at right now, but curious to know your thoughts. Like, do you think you guys can do this on your own individually? No. <laughs> no. And I would, I would say also, why would we want to, yeah. right? It's, it's just probably to answer properly would be, yeah, you can innovate on your own, but why would you? It's only going to slow you down and it's going to, you're going to be limited by your creativity. Now, if you're a company with 60,000 employees, well, that's different than a company with a thousand employees, right? So you, the, the size of your scale weighs into that type of decision, but you know, for where we are and what we're doing, why would we want to do it by ourselves? We want to go faster. We're going to, we're going to reach for outside help. I think companies can innovate by themselves. I think it really comes down to how does it fit within their business strategy? What's the size of their company? What resources do they have available? How quickly do they need to change and innovate? Um, is it mostly internal innovation or it's focused on internal operations or are they wanting to deliver products to the market? Um, and I think really where you want your competitive advantage to sit. I think it's it's a, a more maybe complex answer than, you know, can they do it or yeah, can they not right. do it? I think there's a lot of, of elements to that that is unique to, to each business um, in their market position on how they want to go about doing that. Just as an example, if you really felt like you had a lot of IP that you could go to market with, do you really want to bring in external partners to help you with that if you felt like you had an advantage? Perhaps not. But if maybe it was something where you felt like your competitive advantage was your ability to implement something at scale and at speed more quickly and you weren't necessarily as concerned with your competitors being able to get that innovation and, and coming to market with it um, as quickly, mm -hmm. then you might be more comfortable bringing in more partners or you're really looking for um, you know, bringing in the right skills and the right talents at the right time to be able to move innovations forward as they're, they're maturing. So I think it really depends a lot on the organization, where they're at in, in the marketplace, what their, you know, their, their lines of business are. Right. Um, even in energy, you know, there's a lot of different lines of business in energy and, and really thinking about how they want to move that innovation program forward as a part of their, their business strategy. I think those are really important variables to consider when we think about the, the breadth of partnerships that take place and what kind of partnerships from the size of the partner startup mm -hmm. to something much larger or to the, the proliferation of the partnerships as part of their innovation portfolio. Absolutely. Yeah, my, my thoughts are, um, yes, companies absolutely can innovate in a silo. They can do it on by themselves. But it, it absolutely depends on what Afshin said. It depends on your business strategy. Like um, in my day to day, I see innovation every single day. Yeah. Um, progress in some sort, you know, small incremental type things that, that move the company forward. I also see ones that I would call a little bit more sustaining that drive a little bit of competitive advantage. Um, you know, for some examples with Aventive most recently been working around things like wet sand or sand piling, 
Um, are these disruptive to the industry? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But do they add meaningful return to shareholder? Yeah, they do. They add real, real value, you know, millions of dollars to the bottom line. Now, if you're if we're trying to think around like disruptive type of innovation in a reliable sense, I, I think it is very unlikely that a company could go it alone. You know, so if you if you think you can make like a small group of like an R&D team, put a couple people there and say, hey, look for the next big thing, you know, look for the game changer. I think it's highly unlikely that you're actually going to find that because most innovation in my mind does not start and end with a person or a small group. It happens by putting a lot of people and ideas together and getting really messy and uncomfortable with it. And then ultimately you say, you know what, that's that's kind of interesting. Like, I didn't like that at all, but you took that idea and then they took that idea and then she took that idea. And next thing you know, it's turned into something that everybody kind of looks at and says, well, I, I never would have gotten there by myself, but I, I, now I really like it. So I think, yes, companies can innovate by themselves, but it depends on their business strategy and what they're going for. How do you think um, partnerships will fit into a company's broader innovation strategies? Like, do companies even have a broader innovation strategy as part of, you know, whether it's internal or external or how do you, how, how have you seen that? Yeah, I can, I can jump right yeah. in there too, uh, kind of where I left off. Um, I think it has to be a portfolio yeah. approach. Generally speaking, um, when you're a company that's established, especially public companies, um, there, there's something to play for, so to speak. You know, you're in the game, you have a lot of equity on the table, you have a lot of shareholders, et cetera. Um, most of your innovations are intentionally on the lower risk, lower return profile. It's more in business sustainability, you know, um, reasonable size growth, et cetera, those kinds of things. Now, on the flip side, you, you do have to build a portfolio of opportunities that is a little further out, a little higher risk, a little higher reward. So it, in my mind, it just comes down to a balance. You know, you have to have a portfolio approach to ideas, portfolio approach to risk. In my mind, once you get to a certain level, that, that's what you look for in a sustainable business. You know, when I think about how partnerships fit in strategy, you know, I think, again, start with a business strategy. Your technology strategy should fit directly within what you're trying to achieve with your business and your innovation strategy should really link to both of those right because in today's business world it's it's probably unlikely that you would be able to do something without technology so those three things i, I do think have to be linked when we think about how partners fit into the overall strategy i, I think it depends on what you need then there are different kind of partners so there are partners that come in with specific technology solutions that might be a partner that you bring in in a certain spot there are partners that just bring you skills and talents. Um, and those might be a partner ecosystem you create to be able to augment your own teams to be able to move those forward. And those can evolve and change as you progress and mature through your innovation program and your innovation strategy. Um, I think, you know, coming back to, to Ben's point about the portfolio, you know, as innovation programs mature, they start getting that, that ability to have that portfolio. Um, so long as those risk profiles are, are appropriately aligned to the business strategies, I think they can be very successful and they can be very strategic. Mm -hmm. um, I think when the risk profiles of your innovation programs don't align with your business strategies, that's where I think you can start seeing some challenges. Big gaps start emerging. Yeah. Some gaps. I think you touched on a really important point there and that's the risk profile, right? There is risk with innovation. Absolutely. And a lot of times I think, I think we forget about that and we think innovation is only gonna drive a great outcome. But you know, it may drive a bad outcome. But as long as you're learning from that that process, that's that's a huge piece of innovation, right? You iterate through that, fail, and learn something from it, continue to move forward. Well, and, there, and the reality of it is, is there's risks even with partners. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So with with partners that are coming in and bringing you um, um, just skills, right? They have churn. They're fighting for talent in the yeah. marketplace as well. And so using a partner, you could experience some of that, or even with startups. You know, where startups are really great is they tend to focus on really specific technologies and they go deep and they can really help you advance those applications of those technologies. But there is risk. What if the startup isn't there next month? Yeah. What if they get acquired by someone you would perhaps prefer not to work with? Mm -hmm. What do you do with that technology now if you've integrated into a critical business process? So there's a lot of things I think have that have to be considered from a risk perspective, risk reward perspective when thinking about that portfolio and strategy and how it ultimately connects up to um, what the organization is trying to achieve from a business perspective.